Hi everyone, um, this is Michael Tierra, and I'm uh, very honored and privileged to be able to present a, a really wonderful webinar uh, on the medicinal plants of the High Sierras and the Owens Valley, presented by acupuncturist and herbalist Benjamin Zappin. Benjamin has been a, a, an herbalist since 1995, studied with me in my clinic for a number of years, and is now a licensed acupuncturist in, in uh, San Francisco. And he is co-founder of the Sylvan Institute, which we'll show you in a moment. And uh, welcome, Ben. I'm going to uh, change you to a presenter now. Fantastic. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. And can you see my screen? Yes, and you can enlarge it if you like, if you can. OK, great. OK. Show my screen. And let's see. Let me reduce part of this. Okay, so as Michael just mentioned, we are going to look at medicinal plants of the High Sierra and the Owens Valley. The Owens Valley is a large valley to the east of the Sierra Nevada, which is, for those of you who may not live in California, it's a mountain range uh, that runs along. Um, the eastern side of the state from about you know the Mojave Desert up, <clears throat> up and tapers off uh, and kind of turns into the Cascades, the Southern Oregon Cascades. And um, the highest peaks there, which are some of the highest peaks in the continental United States, are about 14,500 feet. We didn't go quite that high. Um, this is a region that I've been going and wild crafting in and you know, harvesting the medicinals that I've been studying for my whole career and I continue to use extensively in my clinic, my clinical practice, and in the products that my uh, wife and I assemble for our Five Flavors Herbs line. So um, you'll see on this first slide here, there's URLs for that and uh, our educational business that I run with another a former student of Michael's, Thomas Avery Guerin, which is called Sylvan Institute of Botanical Medicine. Um, I want to feature, so we recently went on this trip, and as Michael mentioned, I was a student of his in his clinic for a long time, and um, doing something like that, you know, having a four-year mentorship with somebody, you know, you're, they, they become part of the fabric and foundation of how you think and how you see, and uh, so, you know, Michael has set a foundation for, you know, an inquiry into use of native medicinals in the scope of Chinese medicine um, in his planetary herbology book. So that is, you know, something that I consider myself to be, you know, part of a part of a lineage in and part of a, you know, a collective of people in the United States who are you know, studying Chinese medicine with some some rigor, but also so in love with their native medicinals that they can't, can't bear to not be without them. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at that intersection of how these plants work. The language we're going to be looking at is going to be uh, largely that of Chinese medicine. Um, and so, you know, having studied with Michael, I've been goading him and prodding him to come out on these wild excursions with us for you know, the, the totality of our relationship here. And this year was the first time that we actually effectively coaxed him out of you know, his own reverie into ours uh, and got him to come camping, which you know, was one of, the, one of the high times of my herbal career to get to take Michael out into the field and be in some really exhilarating spaces that I think once you see some of these photos that we took on this trip, you'll uh, get, a, get a flavor for the kinds of environments we were in. So I just spent the better part of two weeks in end of August, early September, teaching, harvesting, and uh, next year uh, you'll have an opportunity to come join us for one of these excursions. If you pay attention, you can get on our mailing list, etc. So I want to jump forward a bunch of slides. There's three clusters of slides that I want to move through um, that don't have a lot of information. It's just pictures of plants and names of plants. Uh, and those three clusters, I'm really quickly here going to move down. 
So the, we're going to look at apiaceous plants or uh, plants in the Apiaceae parsley family. We're going to look at a cluster of plants that were growing together where we found a, a little treasure trove of medicinals for the respiratory system growing in the same place. But I want to start out with looking at a grouping of high elevation plants affecting consciousness and the treatment of pain. Um, on this trip, we tallied and harvested about 40 different plants. Now you can imagine, uh, for those of you who are uh, in pursuit of uh, the notion of bioregional herbalism that is emphasizing a relationship with the land that you live on and being able to uh, utilize medicinals growing in your place, um, you, know, you, you decide what your terrain is, what your turf is, what you know, how many concentric rings from you know ground zero of you you're willing to move out from and still call it bioregional. We drive out to the Sierra, uh, but I'm a Californian, so I consider it my turf. So anyhow, most of the plants that I use, you know, 50% of the plants that I use in my clinical practice, I harvest myself, and uh, the rest are largely drawn from the Chinese repertoire. So first, I just want to feature anemone drummondii, uh, also known as Western pask flower uh, or wind flower. Uh, the, the name anemone refers to, um, I think, some Greek uh, deities that uh, were gods of the wind. So anemone drummondii is uh, one of these pest flowers, also related to homeopathic pulsatilla. Uh, it is a comative sedative. When you look at its homeopathic indications for pulsatilla, they more or less correspond to actions commonly associated with application of this plant, related plants. And I can tell you that this was the second time that I've seen this species. Uh, and you know, we got to connect with it a little more intimately on this trip. And Michael may want to chime in at some point and let us know if he's since had some experiences with that which he harvested. Um, I have a lot more experience with another species that you'll see in a minute. but. Uh, it's a comative sedative that's a low-dose botanical commonly associated with being used in um, menopausal anxiety for, you know, wan, deficient, uh, slender, anxious, uh, possibly easily sweating, not exactly yin deficient, but easily sweating women tends to be the association in the writings of the eclectics and homeopaths. Um, I do not think it's gender specific in any way. That was an association that they drew. Um, find it crosses the line neatly into treating men of similar uh, constitutions. You know, this, again, frail, anxious, um, meandering thoughts type of individual. Now, when I use this, I use it frequently, but I rarely use it as a simple. Really investigated it, taking it by itself quite a bit. Um, again, in low doses, higher doses, uh, and tend find that it really anchors thought. And when you think of what what wind does in the body, um, you know, wind wind creates movement, and I tend to feel like there's a a bit of a doctrine of signatures thing happening with this plant because uh, you know, with its name windflower, its seeds are dispersed on the wind. You're going to see some representative of another uh, another species in just a minute. Uh, you think about wind, what wind does with consciousness. It is erratic movement. It's unpredictable. It's unstable. You can think of meandering thoughts, uh, repetitive thoughts. Uh, you know, some anxious, unuseful, worrying tendencies. These are all associations that I have with anemone. Um, you can think about how wind is generated in the body, and it can be generated uh, by both dryness. Uh, you think about the, the wind that's generated in the desert or in high elevations, uh, along with dryness, and that it can create dryness being very figurative here. Um, so this can really anchor that, that type of wind from dryness and wind from dryness generated by stagnation, uh, 
of blood, of dryness of liver blood uh, is a common scenario, liver kidney yin deficiency, um, if you still believe in yin deficiency. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and also from uh, dry in the deficiency, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> um, anyhow, so I, I tend to see this more with cold individuals. And as I mentioned on our camping teaching trip, uh, one of the most common patterns that I associate this with is one of deficiency cold of the kidneys, but in somebody who is, is fairly frail. Um, and it's, it's really a cinnamon twig constitution. If you read into um, the different constitutional types associated with some of the Chinese formulas, uh, I recommend looking at Huang Huang's 10 formulas constitution book. And I know Michael in the East-West course uh, shares some of this information also. Um, yeah, this is what, this is one of the first herbs that uh, Ben turned me on to actually experiencing in his clinic when he was in Santa Cruz before we moved to San Francisco, and uh, I was really impressed with how Im immediately uh, experiential it was. It, it it just had a, a tremendous uh, quieting effect on the brain. It was amazing. Uh, one of the uh, great sources, uh, I think, for the kind of esoteric information about herbal medicine is a book that comes out of the 1920s by, by a, a man who was both an herbalist and a homeopath named Berkey. And I think it's interesting to, to see what he thinks about how he describes uh, pulsatella, the keynote being uh, obviously for someone who's extremely sensitive uh, uh, he describes a, a, a woman with light hair and blue eyes and who's timid. Uh, they seek cool places, open windows, even in the winter, fresh air, uh, both children and for women with menstrual complaints and menopause. And uh, it's very specific for uh, moodiness, rapid change in mood, sensitive and tearful, extreme pleasure and pain. Uh, and I could go on like that, but I would suggest that you uh, that you take uh, the initiative and just look up pulsatilla and the homeopathic indications and realize that, uh, as, I rec as I understand it, Ben, this is not an herb that you take in substantial dose. This is a... Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, you, know, you might use it in a three to 10 drop dose. Exactly, and you and feel it in, in that dosage. Uh, if, if it is fresh, now this is uh, interesting because, you know, it's been suggested that this the constituents in this, which are alkaloids, it's in the Ranunculaceae family, um, related to you know a distant relative of aconite, um, is that the constituents the they degrade fairly quickly, and I have some that I've been using for that I harvested maybe four or five years ago that uh, you you know I I still use it and I have still used it as a simple and seen that it works and felt like oh I can really push the dose with this stuff. Well, I recently harvested some more both Occidentalis and the anemone drummondi that was in this last slide. So these are related plants, they're both of the same genus. Um, pressed out the tinctures recently and they are so acrid and so spicy and really part of the reason that you want to be careful of taking it in low doses is because of the intensity of the acridity is actually a irritant to the mucosal membranes and I found out just how irritating it can be. Um, very Commonly, you know, we like to do do provings when I'm pressing out tinctures and or macerating tinctures, and you know, so I was kind of pushing it and taking taking a bit. And how, much like it, take, how much did you take? A an unmetered dose. <laughs> Thirty drops or more. I, you know, it was at the bottom of the blender that I rinsed out and was diluted it quite a bit with water, I and see. just kind. Of, kept sipping on it and sipping on it and got some little ulcerations in my mouth from it um, and got a real heavy dose of its medicinal virtue and you know, it was very very calming very sedating very anchoring uh, and you know as I as I like to say it it, it kind of helps helps clean the slate of neurosis and get me get me to a place of functional clarity 
Um, so one of the interesting things about this herb, um, I, I, I know we have a lot to cover, Ben, so we probably should move on, but is uh, that it's, it's used bo both in Chinese medicine as well as Western herbal medicine. And the Western herbal uses are uh, mostly uh, psychotropic, um, affecting the mind and the emotions and so forth. But the Chinese use the dried herb, and it's called Bai Tu Wang, and it described the properties as bitter and cold, and it goes to the large intestine, the liver, and the stomach. It's basically known as pulsatilla. And they use it in tea in a substantial dose of 6 to 15 grams daily. And it's used to clear heat and toxic fire and for treating dysentery. So um, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting situation where the, when the herb is fresh, it has one properties and this is not true in all herbs, by the way. Uh, in fresh, it's used in a smaller dose for one purpose, and in a larger dose, when dried, it's used for uh, dysentery in Chinese medicine. So, okay. And on and just forward. a quick note on combinations. I, for treatment of anxiety, you know, for the mind calming, I, I very frequently combine it with skullcap. Western skullcap, either a native species or Scutellaria lateriflora, uh, and California poppy. I feel like it combines exceptionally well for those, with those for calming the mind acutely while using other remedies to support the constitution. And as I mentioned, one of the things that um, I use it with a lot, a lot is uh, cinnamon twig formula with oyster shell and dragon bone, the underlooked formula that I use a lot. So take, take note. Yeah, these these herbs from this from northern uh, northern California area are so strong they would make most Chinese herbalists uh, really sit up and, and and reconsider adding them to the Materia Medica. They're really really powerful, and uh, uh, Pulsatella anemone is one of them, and the others that that, that Ben was going to tell you about are, are pretty amazing. They're very experiential. Okay, yeah. it's a beautiful picture. Ah. Uh. This is this is actually on Mount Shasta. Uh, my, my this is a nice mountain. nice place to go. <coughs> my holy mountain, but not but not harvest anemone. So it's very very scenic. Yeah. Um, this is peony brownii, and uh, again, this little cluster is things that can treat pain and treat consciousness, and you know the the application of Peony in Chinese medicine is vast and varied. Shows up in one of three species in just about every possible uh, every possible formula. Um, you see Mudan P in all of the Ramania formulas. Um, anywhere that cinnamon twig is applied, you see uh, peony show up as a supportive herb. As, it's usually showing up with either a warm acrid herb to release the exterior to constrain the dispersion uh, of that warm acrid herb in the case of being a complement to cinnamon. Uh, in the case of Bupleurum or Chai Hu, it's almost always used as an auxiliary herb to buffer the dispersion. You know, so it's sour, it restrains the leakage of fluids, but it's also moving. You know, so it's, it, it has, dynamic functions that are seemingly contradictory within the same plant. Um, you know, also it's, it's relative churchow or red peony will be used to disperse blood. Well, I've, I've developed quite a relationship with peony brownii and peony californica, which are our two West Coast native species. The range of californica is really from the Bay Area down mostly in the culture coastal ranges down to northern Mexico. Um, peony brownii is found in all the coastal ranges um, and interior ranges, mountain ranges, um, from about the Bay Area north, including in the High Sierra. Uh, I could talk a lot more about its range and habitat and growth form, et cetera, but uh, these are some of the sliced roots. And if you smell its aroma, it, there's a lot of similarity to both Churchow, red peony, and Mudan pea. Um, I tend to use this like those, which from a Western 
Herbal Action Point standpoint, we're looking at amenagogues, you know, things that can um, moderate uh, menstrual discomfort, looking at uh, antispasmodics, both looking at using it as an antispasmodic, both for skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. Um, so can use it for menstrual cramps, hiccups, um, pain of the neck and shoulders with some of the plants you're about to see uh, coming up. So what do we know? We can combine peony with licorice. Uh, which is, um, oh, I'm forgetting the Chinese name for that formula. Anyway, yeah, you combine yeah, licorice. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Um, Shaoya Gan Sao Tam is the Chinese name for that. So that is used as a foundation for uh, treatment <laughs> of pain anywhere in the abdomen. And if you look at the amount of formulas that that little rudiment shows up in, it's really vast. Um, I've taken cues from Chinese medicine as to how to use this uh, and you know we'll combine it in things as I mentioned for skeletal muscle pain and I combine it with kava, pedicularis, um, maybe a small amount of arnica depending on how the issue was created. For internal treatment I might combine it with uh, cramp bark, I might combine it with black cohosh, uh, for menstrual pain, um, you know, depending on the presentation. And I might just use this, which I love to harvest and love to use with uh, licorice, ginger, jujube dates, and cinnamon as cinnamon twig decoction, uh, which, you know, the functions of which are vast and varied for both internal and external uh, medicines for the treatment of pain, internal organ disharmony. Uh, and external invasions. So extremely dynamic, yet very not so understood by Western herbalists, uh, which is it's, it's actually a fairly prolific plant in the wild and something that I think it's, its use, ju you know, judicious use, judicious harvesting could be uh, further pursued. Uh, well, areas around uh, Reno, Nevada, and so forth, I've seen whole hillsides full of this peony, uh, whether it's this be uh, probably brownie, I probably not California. And uh, so there is quite a bit of it out there. Uh, again, it's this is not something I would at all recommend commercializing. However, uh, and, uh, even garden peony can be used, and that would be that would be the white peony as opposed to the wild peony, which the Chinese specify as the one that moves blood. Uh, I think of peony as uh, somewhat, from the Western perspective, as as uh, some of the uh, uh, people on the East Coast might think of the use of lobelia, except I think peony has much more of a, new <clears throat> of a nutritious property, and it's not quite so powerfully antispasmodic as lobelia is, but it's, it's more nutritional, and it works on a lower, works a little bit lower than the than, than uh, lobelia working more on the lungs and peony works more on releasing tension in the stomach and the abdomen. So I think adding a small amount to uh, many, many formulas as, as a kind of adjuvant uh, to uh, help the other herbs be better accepted and better utilized and to relieve tension and resistance to, to uh, uh, things in general is a good idea. Look at that beautiful flower. I've never seen it in flower. I've only been around. Oh, it's it's heavenly, and its aroma is is really really kept. Um, you know, it, uh, in the writings of the eclectics, and when you look at ethnobotanical literature, uh, you will find that uh, it was actually used as a respiratory antispasmodic, which is very different than its application in Chinese medicine. Yeah. Uh, there's also mention of using it as an anticonvulsant. Uh, for seizure disorders, along with lobelia, along with skullcap, so absolutely, this which is also something that you don't see in the Chinese medical literature. So, uh, you know, again, this is brief mention in eclectic writings and isn't backed up by case studies, so okay, it's hard to know. Moving on, you got a lot, of, a lot of herbs to cover. We only done two, and we've gone through twenty-five minutes. <laughs> okay, so, um, so. Argemini munitus, this is prickly poppy, 
and this is a substantial skeletal muscle relaxant. Um, most of these I use in tincture. Most of the things we're talking about I use in tincture, and uh, this is in the poppy family, the Poppaveraceae family. Think of other plants that are related that you may be familiar with uh, and have an association with treatment of pain. California poppy I use a lot. Um, Corydalis. That's one of my favorite herbs currently, California poppy. And yeah, it's... I've just never seen a better herb for insomnia than that. Oh, for insomnia, for anxiety, for, for road rage. It's um, so easy to grow and so easy to make. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous it, to think about how effective it, it, it is. It should be more celebrated than it is. There's people that um, know who are in Ambien. Just tell them to start taking a teaspoon of uh, California poppy before they go to bed. Uh, um, so our Gemini here, which this is very scenic. This is the eastern slope of the Sierra. This is around Bridgeport um, en route to some hot springs, uh, looking out into the valley. And uh, this is much stronger than California poppy. This is one of the stronger native analgesics that I know of. Wow. Um, you know, it it tends to be pretty soporific. You know, it it will make you tired. Um, but you know, for, I use this in people who are trying to, you know, people who've been in significant accidents, uh, people who have. You know, for instance, as an acupuncturist, a lot of people come to me with musculoskeletal pain, and sometimes that pain is irretractable and due to a structural problem such as a herniated disc. And you know, we'll we'll give some Argemini munitus on top of a Chinese formula to to give a much more potent analgesia. Um, you know, and it tends to work. People right, people great. feel like this really helps them in the way that an opiate would without the potential for dependence. You know, so for people who have pain that maybe warrants taking uh, you know, something stronger than ibuprofen, um, this, this can be a very useful ally. Uh, that's all I'll say about it for now. Anyway, it's really, really beautiful. And I, I hope that you put on your, make a note to uh, contact Silva Institute. Uh, East West wants to co coordinate uh, some field trips with them next year. Um, it's just an ex incredible experience. I mean, coming here for our seminars, of course, is really important as part of the coursework. But most of you would really like, to, like I'm sure, to get out into the wilds. And Ben and uh, Christopher Hobbs sometimes goes along. I go along. Uh, Brian Weisbuck goes along. And it's just a, just a blast in, to be in these beautiful places when people are talking about herbal medicine the whole time. And for, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a very important opportunity for fellowship in the wild. And the other and, thing is we don't want to take any more than 15 people. So if you see it, one you want to go on to, you better register right away. We might put up another one, but having too many people along takes away the fun, I think. Don't you, Ben? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really great opportunity for an intimate experience. And it, it can be overwhelming with too many people. Absolutely. And it's too many people for me to cook for on a camp stove. Oh, <laughs> Ben's cooking. Oh. <laughs> that should be a, that should be a separate thing in itself. We, <laughs> he cooks for the seminar, and and his his cooking is amazing. Even his outdoor cooking was amazing this last time. I think he made lamb tagini there, which was amazing as a campfire <laughs> cooking. <laughs> lamb tagini, yeah. All right, let's um, go on, Ben. So here's Valeriana sachensis, which I think I have a sexier picture than this. Um, Earlier on, That's this is uh, one, of, one of our native valerians, and so something that I've been exploring as a topic of interest, and just really just something I've been in awe of that I want to transmit is when you when you find formulas in the wild, use them, and you know in this place that we took a group, which it, you know was it close to ten thousand foot elevation, what was growing together, but anemone valerian and a couple other plants that will show that are useful for uh, you know that are psychotropic that will shift your consciousness and can alleviate pain um, valerian this native valerian and anemone growing right next to each other you know so it's there's something about the environment that you know is is providing us with a cluster of plants that intersect nicely with aspects of our human experience and you know it's it, 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 I don't believe that 
<laughs> That's all right, go ahead. But Michael doesn't believe in divine intervention. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I just, I just, it's a, it's a, it's, it's fine. It's, it's a, it's, uh, it's poetry. It, it's a way of being in the environment and interfacing with it. And, and I have other examples. It's, you know, it's, uh, it, I don't think that you should just start picking clusters of plants in the same environment and thinking that they're supposed to do something because they're together. It's, you know, it's a uh, correspondence, if you will. So this is very similar to our, uh, Valeriana officinalis. It's certainly related and certainly has a related set of functions for the treatment of pain, uh, tension, and stress, and can be supportive in uh, sleep and facilitating sleep. So um, this is my preferred species that I use, and we'll put it in sleep form. Ulas, we'll put it in formulas for hypertension as an auxiliary to other things that treat other aspects of the hypertension uh, profile. Uh, as it is an aromatic plant, if you look in the writings of the eclectics, they're using valerians as uh, digestive support herbs. And it's worth looking at the energetics of these as a kind of warm acrid herb that's actually more arousing to consciousness and clearing of uh, congestive dampness uh, in the spleen to facilitate mental focus. So if you look at it working on the, the spleen heart axis, uh, that's how I, I tend to think of this. In smaller doses, larger doses, it'll help you sleep. Smaller doses, it will clear that congestion um, of you know, <laughs> uh, and facilitate focus, facilitate uh, access to higher consciousness, if you will. Uh, you have you have thoughts on Valeriana sicensis, Michael? Yeah, don't, I I, don't I took a I, I took some recently. I took about thirty drops, and man, it is one of the darkest, the most tomasic herbs I've ever seen and experienced. It it just really is is very very heavy and and dulling, and um, so it's very good for insomnia. But I I, I recommend it. Uh, I com I combine it with California poppy, and I I put it. I use about a third or less of that with California poppy, and now, now you have an incredible sleep formula. This is a very, very strong herb, and uh, those of you who are aficionados of Sherlock Holmes will, will note that Sherlock Holmes was addicted to cocaine, and uh, Dr. Watson used to give him valerian all the time as an antidote, and he, he would take his drops of valerian. Um, so uh, anyway, that's been my experience with 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 this this valerian uh, particularly, but e even valerian in general is very heavy. There's uh, one that's used in Himalayan valerian. Uh, I think it's I, I forget the name the Sanskrit name of it, but uh, it's it's a smoother one. I think uh, probably the smoothest of all of them, and it's used uh, for any kind of vata disorders. Are you talking about nardostachys? Yes, nardostachys. Yes, uh, and it's it's used with with uh, a number of other herbs that are used in Ayurveda for the for the uh, nervous system, uh, but uh, um, morning glory see, uh, root, for instance, is used there by them. And uh, so anyway, I, I would say uh, combine combine this to a, a point. To something to use in a formula to boost its its sedative properties, and and not as a primary herb. That's my experience. What do you, what do you think, Ben, about that? So, in in contrast to that, I think it's dose specific, and if you look at the energetics of what these are doing, as I just mentioned, um, this being, you know, I I agree it has the that potential to be very dark. But if you contrast this to a fish and Alice, this has more sweetness to it. And you know, I also think that California poppy has the potential to be very dark, but I also think that if somebody's in a very agitated state, it's really a cooling bitter herb that if you take it in smaller doses can help re you know, reduce heat that's flaring from the heart, agitating the mind, reduce that liver heat that's either from deficiency or excess, creating lots of anger, irascibility, um, I've never had that experience with California poppy. I've taken a teaspoon of the tinctures. And... So 
Um, maybe you're just not angry enough. Uh, Anyway, I, I I think it's, these are these are incredibly powerful and beautiful herbs and should be definitely included in 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 a, in a medicinal herb. So, so so my suggestion is that people try them in different doses, and in different situations, and that's how I've over time developed relationships with both different potentials with doses and um, seen some of the potential for these. And I think that California poppy, you know, in five to ten drop dosages, you know has a different effect than taking it as in a teaspoon. So let me, uh, let me, let me uh, do a little commercial here for, for Ben, tuning his horn for him. <laughs> uh, if, if you are in interested in any of these plants, extracts of the live plants that, that, that you're seeing them here, and I know we went out together and we harvested things and he takes them back and makes extracts of them. If you want any of them, uh, you better contact him ASAP because uh, I don't know how long he's gonna stay in business with with the way things are going these days, but uh, he's got wonderful, ex <laughs> wonderful extracts of these things, and and they're really potent. And you might want to really, really stock up and get a bunch for your clinic. And uh, uh, so, so uh, you'll see his email and so forth, how to contact him, and uh, that's where you get these plants now. Unless, unless you want to go to the Sierras and pick them yourself. Okay, going on. Um, so one of the plants with which this partners very well, as I mentioned oh, from my little paint, oh um, my see some different representatives of a genus Pedicularis. Pedicularis means lousewort, or uh, pedicules are actually, it's actually lice. So there's an association with using these for treatment of lice in livestock. So this is a few different species that we saw growing in the same habitat. Pediculus semi, uh, Pedicularis semi-barbata on the left, and Pedicularis gronlandica growing on the right. This is like Here a, a non-mind-altering marijuana. <laughs> it uh, just completely lays you back and 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 in the most pleasant state, but but it's not. It doesn't alter consciousness. It's wonderful. It's well, it's, it it alters somatic consciousness more than it does create yeah. euphoria or dysphoria. I, um, when I took, my a, when I took my a, a walk up there, that's a, it was I, quiet for a long time. Maybe I should take some now, Ben. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a very it's a very profound and useful plant, and uh, useful as a skeletal muscle relaxant. As I mentioned, uh, also useful to combine with valerian, peony, kava. Um, it's beautiful. You know, or or possibly black cohosh, which I use more for musculoskeletal conditions than I do for menopausal complaints. What a beautiful um, plant! It is really a stunner, and um, the here, here's where I get to get really personal. This uh, pedicularis uh -oh. florist right here is in this. This is a picture in the stand in which I proposed to my wife, Ingrid. Uh -oh. um, after after Michael called me and said, "You need to make an honest woman of her." <laughs> it was because Michael told me to do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I used as a tincture or used as a tea. Some people take to smoking the flowers. Um, interestingly, in the Chinese literature, there's six or seven different species, not commonly translated in English, but our uh, dear friend and colleague Thomas translated some of these and found that this is a plant that is associated with nourishing the kidney and liver yin and relaxing the tendons. So whereas the exact epistemology of how pedicularis is used in the West is not clearly understood, actually stops at Michael Moore making, making the suggestion and nobody knows exactly where he got that information and uh, my understanding is he wasn't that clear where he got that information. But it's become very popular amongst Western herbalists, um, and the association am amongst Chinese herbalists is that it does something very similar, but with a different descriptive language. So um, I use this for stress associated with musculoskeletal trauma. Um, I also use it for, you know, just typical. That we I think I think we all have some musculoskeletal trauma in the modern world from driving and using computers unless you're doing yoga every day. You know, you 
your body's familiar with some of this tension that's accumulated in uh, some of your larger muscle groups. And, and I will also use it as an adjunct to other forms of therapy in treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's usually some uh, physical holding patterns that will show up in uh, these psycho-emotional, more profound psycho-emotional uh, presentations. So this is a very, that's a very exciting and very wonderful plant. These plants in, in this region are just absolutely amazing. And uh, this is one of the most amazing of all of them. So I wonder if it's been cultivated at all, Ben. Do you know anything about that? I don't. That's a great question. Um, I hate to think I have to look into that, see if we're just done anything with that. It's, it's very popular in Oregon amongst different Oregonian herbalists. Howie Brownstein's probably this done the most. It's such a great herb. It, should, it shouldn't be legal. <laughs> well, no, I, so think, I think it should be legal. Look how gorgeous the flowers are. These are all related plants that do something very similar, and look how distinct they are. And look at the the, the right, the one on the right, the Groenlandica, the little elephant heads. Um, so check those out. Uh, here's Arnica cordifolia and Arnica longifolia. We saw two or three different species of Arnica up in the High Sierra. And we won't spend too much time talking about this, but you know our grade A herb, either used as an, a liniment, an oil, or a salve for uh, musculoskeletal pain, it works to quicken the blood, to move blood uh, in case of trauma um, from around the joints, from the muscles, will eliminate, will eliminate or prevent bruising. Uh, this is this is a real very powerful plant that obviously is is rather popular um, and it, some of the more popular transmissions of its use have come down from Europe well it's it's widely available in the western United States uh, and you just have to work a little bit to get to it I can tell you that fresh arnica liniment that is liniment or oil made with the fresh plant is much much stronger than anything you get from dried plant material which uh, a lot of what you find in commerce, um, a lot of what you, you know, if you order this from a, a supplier that's a, you know, like a reputable supplier such as Mountain Rose, you know, that produces wonderful plants, um, you're not getting nearly the same strength of medicine as if you're harvesting it fresh. Or hey, purchasing. Ben, would you send me some of that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I need some of the fresh one because I, I don't have any of that. I didn't realize that. And I'm sure you're right. The fresh one's the best. Um, and, it, and it's very aromatic. It's one of those plants that once you smell it in the wild, it has this fruity bubblegum scent that uh, you know, once, you, once you're exposed to that, you'll never forget what it smells like. It's just so distinct. It's poisonous um, internally. Yeah, and it can be used in low dose as a tincture. And what you dose know, so do you recommend? Similarly, it's an irritant, but you can, you can certainly use it in you know, three to ten drop dosages you know, put 10 drops in a, in a couple ounces of herb and you'll be safe. Yep. Um, another very poisonous plant, Aconitum columbiana. I didn't get, this had gone past the flowering stage when we got to it, but uh, something that you can have an opportunity to see uh, in the High Sierra is this plant that, as you know, may know, is a staple in the Chinese repertoire, Futsu. Um, Used homeopathically or used in small drop dosages, uh, it uh, is a very different plant than Fudza. I use it in liniments along with Arnica topically. Um, can use it in liniments for uh, pain and trauma, and you'll see a lot of applications of this in liniments in Chinese herbal medicine also. Um, can also use it in liniments for shingles, use it with St. Uh, blend a little bit of it into St. John's wort oil uh, and it will help uh, the St. John's wort oil will help reduce the inflammation of the expression of shingles. This will topically also deaden some of the inflammation of the nerve. So, um, Well I'm going to cut to the front of this. I'll show you really quickly our uh, URLs here. 
make sure to take note of Sylvan Institute of Botanical Medicines. Um, we have a lot of really exceptional uh, courses, and there's a lot of free material, so please take the time to tour the free material while you're checking out the free material, which has a lot of interviews of um, some elder herbalists in both the Chinese and Western herbal realm, um, free bioregional classes from all around the country. And then we have some more extensive series that you know, will really help deepen your, deepen your uh, herbal studies. Right, and Ben and is one of the adjunct teachers for the East West Herb Course also. And uh, Who's that? I said you're one of our adjunct teachers yeah. for our course as well. And uh, so I think it's uh, the Sylvan Institute is doing some great work. I've really seen the, the webinars that you're offering and so forth. And, and your products and Sweet. teachings and so forth are really great. I'm really proud of you, Ben. Thank you, Michael. Um, going back up here, to the APACA family. So we're, we're moving on from things that treat consciousness and pain uh, to the APACA parsley family. Several of these plants all grow within the same region. And although Michael eschews the notion that there's you know, some, something to be taken note of when things that do something similar grow in the same area, um, I'm I'm just joking. I think I think there's a lot of poetry in herbal medicine. I, I wouldn't decry any of any of the poetry, but what I, what I basically think is that it's a wrong thing to to assume that plants are just there to to deal with all of the afflictions of human beings. They're there to, to deal with themselves and to adjust to an environment and to uh, affect the environment around them. And uh, and it's just a bonus that that we have this symbiotic relationship that we can actually benefit from some of, some of the things that they're doing for themselves that actually have an effect on us. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's very uh, anthropocentric for us to think that they're there for our use. Um, so we're going to take a look at, this is a very poor shot. I didn't get any good shots of Ligusticum grayi, but this is our you know, native California OSHA relative, which for you Chinese herbal enthusiasts is related to Chuanxiong um, or Ligusticum chinense. You can see some much nicer shots uh, at the Berkeley Cal Photos herbarium there. Um, here's a shot. You can see the sky up at you know 9,000 feet. This is some anemone drummondii next to Ligusticum grayi. And you know, for those of you familiar with OSHA, this has really identical uses and is a very potent uh, respiratory herb to deal with various microbial afflictions, very strongly associated with its ability to uh, tackle, uh, especially onset, uh, respiratory viruses. So um, used as a tincture, chewed, uh, or made as a decoction uh, with early onset upper respiratory virus, flus, colds. Uh, this has the ability to treat both cold and hot presentations. You know, so if you're if you're using a energetic lens to discriminate things, which I think is very useful. You know, you're going to have an understanding of what that means, what phlegm phlegm heat uh, and phlegm cold look like, and um, this is something that Hello. Um, I'll use it uh, okay. for early ben, stage. Ben, ben, you blanked out for a little while, and uh, I think probably with everyone. You might have just blanked out again. Hello? Can you hear me? Now we can. Watch your little microphone there and see what's happening when, sometimes when you blank out. Go ahead. Hello? Ben? Oh, boy. Hey, don't you love technology? On the mic? Yeah, okay. Ben says, why, why are you blanking out? Any idea? I don't know. Um, I will 
try not to. Check, check your connections that they're that they're in firmly. Yeah, it's it looks like it's in. Um, well, go ahead. It's, it's, oops, now your screen. Okay. Is yeah. So there we go. That's a nice, nice shot there. So again, this is the anemone that we talked about, and Lacustacum uh, osha, very very potent medicine, very acrid, and uh, can be used to treat. Uh, external pathogenic invasions and coughs. We'll kind of move through these for time's sake. Here is Angelica Brewerai in the same family. This is related to uh, some of the more popular Western Angelicas, of course, such as Angelica, Archangelica, uh, and the Chinese Angelicas, such as Dangue or Angelica sinensis, Duhua, uh, Angelica pubescens. Uh, and Biger, or Angelica de Hurica, uh, which this is a really useful exercise for uh, individuals who are hoping to explore plants in their backyard, um, you know, your big, big backyard that is you know, where, wherever you live, and you know, how, how to understand how to use Angelica breweri when there isn't exactly a strong transmission through Western herbalists of how to use it. Um, we can look to all these different species used around the world and gather information and start to triangulate from those, compare and contrast our perception of flavor that the plant exerts. Um, so if you dig the roots of this, you'll find that they are fairly acrid, but they have some sweetness to them, not quite the same sweetness as Angelica sinensis. And we start to look at what all these plants have in common. Well, they all treat pain but where do they treat pain? Yeah, so we know that uh, Duhua has an affinity for the low back. That is, Angelica pubescens has an affinity for treatment of pain in the low back. Um, Bijer, uh, Angelica duhurica, has an affinity for uh, the stomach channel treatment of facial pain uh, and also occipital pain. So we look at the channel distributions. Uh, we look at uh, where other apiaceous plants such as uh, Changhua go and yeah so we can we can start to say oh, okay this plant is warm yeah and it tastes warm its related plants are warm um, we, can, we can start to feel confident about that and then we can start exploring it in formulation for treatment of both wind cold pathogenic invasion and wind cold damp scenarios uh, in which that coldness is settling into the body. You know, so looking at using it for treatment of arthritis, right? So you know, for the individual who says, yes, I get my musculoskeletal aching and pain, get aggravated by cold weather, um, and which you might experience you know, within a cityscape you know, or within a, a time frame in a day. I, I see a lot of patients who commute and they come into San Francisco from where they live where it's warm and they're like, I ache when I'm here because it's so chilly. So that gives me a lot of information about how I can serve them with plants such as this. Um, you know, I would use it in decoction just as I would so many of the other angelicas uh, and I would also use it as a tincture. Um, and I use it with some of the other plants that I've already mentioned uh, earlier on in the treatment of pain. So we'll, this is a very, very abundant plant. As you can see, it takes it's covering this whole landscape um, where we are staying up at high elevation. Another favorite plant of mine, which I don't have a good picture of, is Osmariza occidentalis, also known as Western Sweet Sicily. Uh, this is a plant that clears dampness and heat. And I really feel like it clears dampness from all three burners, uh, while also seems to have a bit of a supplementing quality for the spleen. Um, because I'm assuming most of this audience is East-West students, uh, I'm taking liberties to jump between uh, Western herbal action type language and uh, Chinese action type language, uh, because you're all either versed in or moving towards being versed in um, 
that descriptive language of both how to treat and how to observe the body. So uh, I will use this very commonly, most commonly as a herb for dampness in the lower burner or middle burner. So for lower burner dampness, it's usually treatment of dampness and heat for which I will combine it with Oregon grape and or uh, powder arco or desert willow, which is a related plant to powder arco for treatment of uh, vaginal candidiasis. Also just combining it for uh, large intestine dampness and heat with Oregon grape. You know, so this functions very similarly to black attractolotus in that way that you know combines with philodendron bark. You talking about the root or the, or the upper parts? Hello? Uh, ben? Are you talking about the root of Osmoriza or the aerial? Um, to create the two mine areas. So very dynamic. It looks like I've been lost again. Yeah. Were you talking about the aerial portions or the root? Oh, I'm talking about the roots. And okay. that's something that Darren and I regretted after our camping trip was that we didn't take the time to dig some of the roots and expose everybody to the amazing fragrance of this plant. I also use it internally uh, very similarly to the application of mushyang uh, or sauceria of Chinese medicine uh, that uh, is used to disperse congestive dampness in the middle burner. You know, so you know, we're thinking about application of something that resolves damp stagnation in the middle burner uh, with signs and symptoms uh, related to qi stagnation, uh, but associated with um, congestion due to you know, inability to transform dampness uh, with uh, more gurgling sounds, maybe loose stools. But you might see this if somebody's had food poisoning. You might see this if somebody has uh, a hangover uh, or is have a devitalized spleen uh, over time that uh, is having a tendency in relation to what they're eating create a congestive dampness scenario. So very profound plant that I think you know has has room to to grow in its application in western states not, not necessarily something like we mentioned with peony that ought to be commercialized as an agent for specific things, but for clinical herbalists, I think there's a lot more room for application of this. It's a very dynamic medicine, a very, very powerful medicine. Um, you just have to go get it or know where to find it, but it, but it is fairly prolific in the mountains of California, Rockies, uh, other coastal and inland ranges hey, west of the Rockies. Yes. Uh, this, is, this has been fantastic. We're nearing the top of the hour. And I wanted to ask you, uh, do you think you have a lot more to go? Because if not, if, if you do, we could uh, uh, postpone it and do a second part in a couple of weeks. Let's do that because I have a whole cluster of respiratory plants. Would you, that, like, would you like to do it again in, in two or let, three weeks? Let's postpone it and, and do the, do the follow-up later. And let's, let's open it up to some questions. Or Good. if you have any questions, Michael. No, I, uh, I, I, think, I think this is one of the most exciting things that we've uh, presented to our students, and we've got 28 people online who all can witness that, and we're saving this as a recording. And uh, you can pass the word along that we're going to uh, do a lot more of it over the next two or three weeks, bring Ben, ben back to he's put a lot of time in preparing this for us. And uh, so we'll do it again, and uh, I hope that uh, this will increase your materia medica substantially. Any questions now? As you can see, you can raise your hand and ask online, or you can write in questions in the questionnaire, which I haven't been looking at. And there we have a number of questions. Sherry says, could you go back to the slide that shows it's easier to see? Could you go back to slideshow? I think these are old questions. Yeah, that's, that's old. OK. Any current question, questions or 
Um, I don't see, oh, there's Sherry's got a hand up, but that must be an old question. I'll unmute you, Sherry, in case you had anything to say. Sherry? Uh, no, actually, I am. I'm fine. That was an old question. Thank you. All right, good. Uh, Sherry was the, the only person on this list who uh, was on our camping trip with us. So. Oh, was she? Oh, huh. Yeah. Oh, Sherry. She was, oh. Actually, she was actually present with us when a lot That's of these... Right. I remember when we were, very, of course. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Sherry. She's definitely a good friend and great community member to us all. Well, I think that's pretty good for now, Ben. What do you What do you think? Um, that's fine with me. I hope that, um, you know, for, I guess my encouragement is for those of you who don't live in Western states, find herbalists who are practicing and using uh, wild medicinals and make it part of your practice and study to use that which grows in your environment. Um, I think that you know the the foundation that you're getting through the east-west course is outstanding and I think that you may need to build your own bridges between that which grows in your environment and the Chinese and Western herbal lenses that you are learning. You know so um, I think that you know part of what I've hoped to impart through this class was some of our critical thinking skills that have you know critical thinking skills and cl okay you been blanked out again um, well anyway I think this has been a great webinar thank you Ben in case you can hear me and uh, thank you everybody for, for attending <laughs>